Okay. Welcome everyone. Okay, one second. We are going to go live on YouTube as well. Or we're going to hope with all our heart that we go live on YouTube. But well, we're gonna pause for one second as we sign into YouTube and then we will go live. I know we're all anticipating this, go live. So many different ways to be watching this conversation. Pause for technology. We're getting set up. I feel like I should be narrating this entire experience. <laughs> all right. Okay, hold on one second. All right. I think we are live. I hear that we have an audience, which is fantastic. And I'm going to get things started. So, hello everyone. I'm Katie Freeman. And on behalf of the Mystery Writers of America, we welcome you to this symposium event for the 27th annual Edgar Awards. Today's discussion is with the nominees for best short story and the recipient of the Robert L. Fish Memorial Award. Our moderator today is Persia Walker and our bookseller is Mystery to Me in Madison, Wisconsin. You can learn more about the Edgar Awards by following us on social media using the Edgar's 2023 hashtag or by visiting the websites mysterywriters.org and edgarawards.com. A few other things. The Edgar Awards will be live streamed on our YouTube channel on April 27th. So keep that in mind if you can't be there in person. I'll be posting links to our panelist books in the chat today. The bookseller again is a mystery to me in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, I'm gonna introduce the moderator now who will take it away for us. Persia Walker is the author of several historical crime novels and short stories. Perennial book club favorites, her books are fast moving, sometimes dark and always surprising. Readers of her 1920s novels know that they're in for a fast paced trip through one of the most fascinating periods in US history, the Jazz Age. A native New Yorker, she has lived in Germany, Brazil, Poland, and now France. She is a former news writer for the Associated Press and a retired US diplomat. Thank you so much, Persia, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Katie, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining today's Edgar Award Symposium for Best Short Story and the winner of the Robert L. Fish Memorial Award for the Best First Short Story. I really need to thank the MWA, Marjorie Flax and Julia Dahl for their support during this process. I'd also like to issue a special thank, thanks to my fellow judges. Tessa Wagert, George Wilhite, and Nick Mamadis. Together we read and reread more than 400 amazing submissions. These guys who are with me here today, you guys arose to the top. You're all winners, but you, these guys wrote really unforgettable stories. So as I talk to the, as we talk amongst ourselves, please feel free to submit questions. We'll try to get to them as we move along. It is now my honor to formally introduce the Edgar nominees and the Fish Memorial Award winner. Greg Fallis, uh, it was a medic in the military, a counselor in the psychiatric security unit of a prison for women and a private investigator specializing in criminal defense. He has taught sociology and criminology courses at American University in Washington, D.C., and Fordham University in New York City. He has also taught det detective fiction for the Gotham Writers Workshop, and he's done this for several years. He has written storylines for online fantasy games, but he is now retired. Our next is, we have Charles John Harper, okay? He has uh, had several short stories published in both Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine and Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. One of those stories, Lovers and Thieves, was selected to appear in the Best American Mystery Stories. He lives in Minneapolis with his wife, Dana. William Burton has also joined us, William Burton McCormick. He writes mystery fiction set in different areas around the globe. 
He is a graduate of Brown University. He earned a master's degree in novel writing from the University of Manchester and was elected a Hawthorne, I hope I pronounced that correctly, writing fellow in Scotland. William is the author of the thrillers A Stranger from the Storm, KGB Banker, Lennon's Harem, and House of Tigers. His short fiction often appears in Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine and Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. He is a native of Nevada, but he has also lived in seven countries, seven other countries, including Latvia, Estonia, Russia, and Ukraine. Tim, Tim McLaughlin is up next. He's the editor of the multiple award-winning anthology Brooklyn Noir and co-editor of Brooklyn Noir. His, uh, his debut novel, Heart of the Old Country, was a selection of the Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writers Program. He won Italy's Premio Pen Award and was the basis for the motion picture, The Narrows. His books have been published in seven languages and his writing has appeared in the New York Times and the Huffington Post. Donna, Donna Moore, we also welcome. She is the author of two humorous crime fiction novels. Her first novel, Go to Helena Handbasket, mm -hmm, won the Lefty Award for the most humorous crime fiction novel. And her second novel, Old Dogs, was shortlisted for both the Lefty and Last Laugh Awards. In her day job, Donna works as an adult literary tutor for marginalized and vulnerable women, and she facilitates creative writing workshops. All of you, it's good to see you. Last but not least, we want to welcome Mark Harrison. He is our Robert L. Fish Memorial Award winner this year. Congratulations, Mark. Mark received the award for Dogs in the Canyon, which appeared in the September-October issue of Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. He worked as a special education teacher and administrator for 15 years before starting his own educational services company. Okay, he lives in Massachusetts with his wife and three children. So please welcome everyone. I am pleased and honored to see you all here. Just to start off a little bit, I thought I would invite each of you to speak to us a little bit about your story. Uh, that you're here for today and did you see something or hear something what was the kernel of the idea greg would you like to start um i suppose i would um i wanted to write about social issues i've always wanted to write about social issues and obviously mass shootings mass murders take place on a routine basis and I wanted to write about some of the laws that, that could help prevent some of those crimes, but um, are objected to by a lot of conservatives, red flag laws. Uh, they're also known as ERPO laws, um, extreme risk protection orders. And they're designed to remove weapons from people who are thought to be a danger to themselves or to others. Um, it's not the sort of subject that you would, that's, that's pleasant, but it has, I think, some really interesting aspects to it. And what I wanted to do is just write about the law itself and how it might help prevent mass shootings that's basically it. Touching and um, go straight to the point without it's willing. Hello again, everyone. I know that uh, Persia's internet is, is fluttering a little bit, as we say. So um, she's going to offer some um, maybe disconnect, come back on, and just would invite William to begin discussing your story. Uh, my story is called Locked In. 
And as the name sort of implies, it's a person who's locked in his basement, um, only to find that the person he summons to rescue him uh, might very well uh, be a murderer. And it sort of becomes a game of uh, cat and mouse of suspense, where this guy, his, his name is Jeffrey, is trapped in, a, in his basement, trying to figure out how to escape while this squatter has essentially taken over his house and wants to get in and eliminate him. Uh, it, the idea came to me because as a, as a child, I used to go visit relatives in upstate New York. And they had a farm and they had a basement. I used to go down there and play and they would go out uh, and leave. And I always wondered, well, what if I was trapped down here? What would happen? Who would help me? And then it occurred to me that what if the person I sought to gain my gain aid uh, had uh, evil intentions, and, uh, and that's sort of built from there. And uh, I said it in the 1940s, uh, as most writers here will understand, because I didn't want my hero to just use his cell phone to call out for aid. I just wanted to, to keep him trapped in there. But I thought, I think it was a pretty universal story because everybody at some point in their life has been trapped in somewhere. And uh, even if it's only in a closet or something for a few minutes, and so I wanted to sort of expand from there. So that was really the, the, the germ of my idea. Thanks so much for that. As you, all sh as you all share some of the origin stories for your stories, I feel like it brings up a lot of resonances for all of us who are listening and readers. Um, Persia, I'm gonna see, how, how is your internet feeling? Well, Zoom valiantly reconnected me after dropping me. I was able to hear most of what William said. It is a... It's a chilling story that he writes, but um, I don't want to ruin the ending, but it's a, it, has a, it has a very satisfying conclusion. So, um, but thank you so much. Uh, let's see here. Let's see, Tim, Tim McLaughlin, would you like to talk to us about the amnesty box? Sure. Um, the, the amnesty box uh, came to me as one scene and for a, a couple of years, I didn't know what the story was going to be because the scene was um, a, a woman who died, who passes away, and her husband has been caring for her, and her last words to him are, I forgive you. And I, I honestly, I don't remember exactly why that came to me that way, but when it did, the first thing I thought was, how would he respond? Would he respond, forgive me for what? Or would he respond... Oh no, she knows what I did. Um, would would it be who would he be and how would he respond to that? And it took me a couple of years to realize that the story was going to be a series of vignettes that gradually reveal who he is. And and so it took me a while to sort of to sort of graft that into what it became. Well, the final product though was excellent. It was well worth the wait. Uh, I have to apologize. My internet is still a bit unstable. I'll try not to disappear on you, but basically I can hear you and I can see you, <laughs> you can't see me. All right, Donna, Donna, can you please tell us about your fantastic story first you turn, then you tell me a lot. Yes, thank you. Um, so my story appears in an anthology of uh, stories inspired by the great noir writer Cornell Woolrich, who is an author that I love. Um, and I love the elements of his stories, the avenging angels, the ticking clocks, the inescapable fates, the waking nightmares, amnesia, loneliness, blackouts, all those lovely uh, joyful things and impending doom particularly. Um, and so I, I didn't really know which of those elements I wanted to take. So what I decided to do was take little bits from lots of different Woolrich stories, including uh, every character in my story has a, a name from a character in a in a Woolrich story. Um, and uh, in my story, his bleak cityscape becomes a crumbling Scottish seaside town that no one visits anymore um, and his depression era time frame um, is reflected in the 
the harsh economic realities of a, a dilapidated amusement arcade, um, which nobody visits anymore because um, they're all playing games on their mobile devices and taking package holidays to the sunshine. Um, and it, I really love the sort of nostalgia of faded glamour and childhood memories, and I wanted to incorporate that. It reminds me of my childhood spent in tents um, where the only, in the rain, where the only joy was visiting these neon encrusted amusement arcades but that as a six and seven and eight year old, um, I really, really loved. So uh, my story has the owner of this dilapidated um, amusement arcade uh, taking a final walk through the place that she has essentially spent the worst years of her life. Thank you, Donna. It's a very engrossing story, very emotionally gripping story. It's a story that, that yes, that will live on with you, that, that stayed with me for sure. I thank you everyone for telling us about your work so far. I did want to congratulate you all and say that as mentioned, many of these short stories were published in Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine and Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. So the links are below, I believe. They, um, they should appear on YouTube. Now I'm going to ask you guys, you know, general questions. So- I, have, I haven't- uh, Oh, I'm talked sorry, about... Charles. How could <laughs> that's I forget okay. you? Ah, see, it's not just my internet that's fluttering. It's me too. Thank you no, for uh, saying that thing. That's fine. Okay. Uh, mine was a backstory and it was actually inspired by Mystery Writers of America had an anthology they were gonna issue and had an open call for stories. And I think it was called uh, When a Stranger Comes to Town. Mm -hmm. And so we have, a, my family, my extended family has owned a, uh, kind of a compound of cabins on a lake in Minnesota for almost a hundred years now. And I've been up there when it's been dark and I'm alone and all of a sudden some headlights come in and you don't know who it is. You don't know, you know, there's nowhere to go because there's woods on both sides. There's a lake behind you. There's, you know, it, you're far away from people. So it's always a little unsettling. And so the premise was, what if somebody drove in and showed up unannounced? Usually it's people that come in and then they realize they picked the wrong road and they turn around and leave. But what if this time it was the right road and the stranger knew that my character was there. And so it's kind of what happens when your past catches up to you. That was really the premise of the whole thing. And uh, I had initially submitted it for that anthology. I got rejected, of course, as it should have, because it wasn't quite ready. You know, there was a deadline. And I, so I added another, I don't know, 1500 words and filled it out and kind of made it better. And then uh, luckily, Linda Landrigan was willing to accept it at Alfred Hitchcock. So that's the genesis of it. Well, it was, again, a story that's definitely worth waiting. I mean, it's a bit dark, but um, I found the ending very satisfying. It's a very visual story. I can see a lot, see, see it playing out in front of me, which is true, actually, for all of your stories. Um, I learned something from each and every single one of you, by the way. I did want to tuck that in and let you know that um, it's, like I said, I'm totally enjoying this, even though I keep popping in and out. So let's see here. I'm sorry, did we, did I talk to Mark yet? Uh, not yet. I can be pretty quick. Um, no, no, don't rush. Go on. <laughs> uh, so my story focuses on... Uh, a narrator who's tasked by his longtime friend uh, and small uh, time criminal uh, with finding a woman who's stolen money from him. And over the course of the story, um, his loyalty and friendship to his friend is, is tested and, and it changes over the, the course of the story. Uh, there was no real kernel to start the story, sort of started from a lot of different pieces and I uh, was able to sort of find an overarching narrative to sort of fit the, the material that I had. That actually leads me to um, a question. And I, I'll, I'll stay with you, Mark, if you don't mind. Uh, this is a question that 
all writers face at some point. Are you a pantser or a planner? Do you have to sit and have all the pieces together before you sit down and write? Or do you mind starting with a kernel, as Mark did, and just go from there? So Mark, if you don't mind continuing. Uh, sure, I'm probably more of a planner, but I probably write in very small amounts. So for uh, maybe I can get up to 300 words at once, and that's probably the most I can do. And but I'll even plan that out a little bit. But um, definitely more of a planner than than just writing um, as a pantser. Greg, what about you? I'm a bit of both. I usually have an opening scene in mind when I start writing. Uh, but before I start writing, I usually have an ending in mind. I almost never actually use that ending, but it gives me something to write towards. If I know where I'm going, then I feel like I can keep, I have momentum, I can keep working towards it. Um, but again, as the story progresses, um, it, you go off in tangents, and I don't think I've ever written a story where the original ending was the final ending. So, what at what point do you do you, do you switch? Is it because something happened in the middle, or the original kernel changed? Well, usually I think as, as you get to know the characters better and the scenes develop, the original ending that I had in mind no longer works. So I just follow the characters and the narrative as it goes. Um, and then at some point an ending becomes clear and you know that's where you go. Donna, uh, what about you? I'm most definitely a pantser. Um, I generally have uh, the very beginning and the very end, um, but that's that's it. I have to have a title. I have to have a title before I start, but that's probably the only thing that's a that's a definite. And then I uh, I write myself into self into various corners, and um, with this story in particular. I knew where I was going because I knew the Woolrich story that I was using as the ending. Um, but then as I went through it, it was, well, how can I make this worse? And I think I found a way to make it worse. Uh, but yeah, I'm most definitely a pantser. I can't actually write a story if I've planned it all out because then I don't want to write it anymore. Hey, William? William, would you like to speak to this or? Sure, sure. I am uh, a complete planner. I'm the opposite of a lot of you folks. I have outlines in every detail and what the character's going through and what, what I'm trying to do to manipulate the audience and everything uh, all the time. With one exception, it's interesting what Gregory said. I usually write the first scene based on some impulse and then decide what I can do with that. And then I plan, 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 and write my whole novel. Not excuse me, my whole short story. Well, it applies to novels too, but my whole short story. And then I realized by the end of it, I didn't really know the character in that initial scene. And so while Greg Gregory he ties up, he rips up his endings. I always rip up my beginnings because I didn't know the character at that point. But that's how I start. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a very detailed. I have outlines, pages and pages and pages of outlines. And then it's not until I have a pretty solid that I start trying to write it. Okay. It's very interesting how everyone thinks so differently. Mm -hmm. um, Tim, are you there? Yeah. Would you like to speak to this? Sure. Uh, on, I'm definitely a, a pantser. Um, I have usually don't know where the story is going until I write it. Um, you know, there's an inciting incident. There's a reason you're sitting down because you've got a scene or you've got an image, but I don't usually have it all played out. And frequently with me, it's, you know, and I think with a lot of, of people that write crime fiction, it's the sort of what if stories, what if something, something relatively insignificant perhaps in your own life, but what if it had gone another way? Um, and one, one of my favorite stories of my own is, uh, was based on shortly before my father passed away many years ago, he had told me when he was in the hospital and he was dying, um, go home and in the basement, you know, look on top of this box and take care of it, for, you know, 
throw it away. Don't let your mother see it. Well, it turned out it was a pack of cigarettes. Um, but until I got home and did that, you know, by the by the time I knew what it was, I already had a short story in my head because what if? Um, so that that's that's the way those things jump off frequently with me. Okay. I I like how everyone uh, has their own process. It seems like you all know what is good for you, your creative process. You've worked with yourselves long enough to know what is the best way for you to produce. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Well, I'll talk. I'm a pantser, totally a pantser. I was telling my daughter the other day, who's a writer as well, I wish I wasn't because I'm working on a story right now and I'm, I don't know, I've, I'm like three quarters of the way through. I don't know how it ends. You know, I, I have, I also have a detective, a noir detectives uh, character that I go back to a lot. And half the time I have no idea who did it, you know, till near the end. And it's, I write a lot of words that don't end up in the story, but I do like that element of discovery as I go along. I like that sense of, instead of me telling the story, which I start out doing, then the story starts telling me things. And I like that, um, how that switches over at some point. And I think it really, get, it makes, makes it feel fresh for me and makes it interesting to keep going, so. Okay, so again, I'd like to build off the last thing you said, uh, Charles. The story starts telling itself. At, at, at what point does it do that? When you have three quarters of it written, half of it written, and how often do you have to, do you have to touch your story, in order to for it to come alive like that uh, every day, every other day, for an hour a day, two hours a day? Yeah, I wish I was more consistent in how often I write. I mean, I just with my I'm an attorney, so I'm busy during the day, and I just you know, at the end of the day I'm kind of wiped out, and so I end up doing a lot of weekends especially and sometimes I'll go to that cabin I was talking about and just spend a whole weekend working on on a story uh, if I feel like I'm getting somewhere with it um, but it yeah it it's there's I rewrite a lot I enjoy I actually like the rewriting process I'm very happy when I finally have this big piece of granite that I've created that I can now start chiseling away at shaping and you know giving it a little more and then I start seeing that like maybe the underlying themes and maybe just those kind of things start to kind of grow out of it. And it, that that's why I love rewriting. I just, I find more and more as I, the more I do it. So that's my process. It's interesting. It's like, again, it's, it's very interesting. I'm thinking about myself, obviously, but today is your day. I want to know how you guys produce these magnific magnificent stories. Uh, Donna, could you tell me again about how often do you touch your material in order to breathe life into it for it to come, come to life like that? Uh, so for a, for a short story, once I start writing it, then that's me. I can't rest until I've finished it. So a short story, will I'll write it pretty quickly. But as Charles was saying, then it goes through loads of editing because I've I've written a lot of rubbish because I haven't known where I'm going. Um, with novels, it's a bit different. And again, like Charles, I, I don't write every day. Um, but once I start writing a short story, then I'm feverishly writing that short story until it's finished. And I don't, apart from that opening scene, I have no idea where it's going until I write it. So which tends to be why I need to do lots of editing. But again, I like that. Um, let's see here. Uh, you can, I, I just wanted to throw out that you can find out uh, to our listeners or viewers, you can find out more about these writers and their work, uh, the work of all Edgar's nominees by visiting mysterywriters.org and edgarawards.org and on social media um, at Edgar's 2023, 2023. Okay, please do share any questions you might have for these authors in the chat or Q&A. Uh, I did want to move on to another question, unless someone wants to adjust this. Do you have any, I don't know, rules for short stories specifically? Rules that come to mind that I've heard knocked around are like having, I don't know, a maximum of three or four characters in your story. 
you know, minimum of one, maximum of three or four, that it has to happen within a certain amount of time, uh, as quickly as possible, compressed, condensed, that the action should start, it should start in the middle of an action, there's no time to build up. Is there anything that you do like that intentionally or unintentionally, subconsciously, just, you know, to, to shape your stories, to give them punch? Donna? Probably the short answer to that is no. Uh, I don't know. Somehow, if I'm writing a short story, then it writes itself short. Um, and and I suppose that I follow the rule of not having too many characters, but it's not a conscious thing at all. It's totally uh, unconscious, and I just write it. And if by the time that I've got to the end of it, I think actually this should be a novel or a novella, then I'll... I'll just hold on to it and and redo it. Um, but yeah, I just go in and see where it goes and see what it ends up like. William, Tan, Mark, Greg, any of you have uh, want to speak to whether or not you feel there are rules that you observe or rules that you should observe when you're writing your short stories? Uh, I don't know that I have any rules, but I do like to start writing with some dialogue, usually a, a bit of dialogue that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the actual story. Um, and then once the dialogue starts, then I think that draws the reader in more, but I don't know that I would classify that as a rule. I, um, I very much believe in the natural length of a story. By that, I mean, I don't set out to write a short story or a novel. I sit down and think, what is the story's, what is the meat of the story? And you don't want to, you don't want to expand it and fluff it up to try to make it a novel, nor do you want to cut it down to the bare bones so you can fill out a short story for some anthology. So I write the story, what I feel is the natural link. It turns out it's a short story, turns out it's a novel, turns out it's a novella you know, then I, I sort of go with that. And which is why I've actually had quite a few novellas lately, because I'm sort of living in that middle area. But uh, uh, this particular story locked in, of course, was so short, it was so immediate. It was sort of the Poe principle, which we all know, which is to to, to get the reader to the this emotional point and then end it. That's, that's what Edgar Allan Poe advocated for, for short stories. And Poe is a huge influence on, on me and I'm sure many, many others here. Yeah, I don't have any rules myself um, in terms of editing. But in terms of editing, I'd say it's more as a guiding principle. It's just more of, is this something that I would want to read? And then that sort of informs, you know, how I'm going to uh, finish the story. Tim? And for me, I would say, uh, kind of like what, what Charles said, I, 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 tend, I tend to write a little, I, my stories tend to be very short. Um, and what I do, I spend a lot of time cutting them down to that to that length because I always feel when I'm writing something longer, there is uh, a lot of pleasure in sort of being able to stretch out into it. But when you're writing short stories, I always feel like every word matters, every comma, you're, you're, you don't have as much wiggle room. And so I wind up chopping them down a lot and doing a lot of rewriting and editing. Okay, so again, I like to always build on the last comment, and a lot of you have talked about writing, basically just letting yourself write. Suppose, what would you say to the person, to the to the writer who sits in front of the, who feels that the beginning is the worst part, right? Some Someone here has said that the middle is the worst part, but suppose you're one of those writers, or you know a writer who sits in front of the blank page and says, um, either they have no idea of what to write, but they feel that they should for whatever reason, or they had a great idea and they sat down to write and all of a sudden the idea seems either unworkable or disinteresting. What do you, what would, what kind of advice would you give to that person or have you experienced it yourself? And if so, what did you do? Uh, Tim, I'd go for it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's happened to me a lot over the years, and it certainly happened to me a lot when I was first trying 
when first learning to write. And I, I don't know if I have any particularly helpful advice except sit down and start typing because there is nothing worse than confronting the blank page more than one day in a row. So if you type something and it's bad, you will change it tomorrow. You will throw it out and start again, but you will not look at that blank page again. Um, I, I find that even on a bad day, if I have an idea that I, I'm somewhat passionate about, sit down and allow yourself to write badly if you're writing badly that day, because tomorrow's another day and you'll fix it up. Very sound, sound advice, I find. Mark, what about you? Since you struggled with your first story. Uh, yeah, so that was just my first, it was my first story. So I probably don't have as much experience um, in terms of everybody else. But, um, you know, I do agree with Tim. I think you just have to write and can always revisit and um, revise. But at least getting that idea down, um, you know, was helpful for me. Greg, do you have any uh, any words of wisdom for writers out there who are facing a blank page or have lost confidence in their ideas? Put words in a row. That's basically it. Just start putting words in a row. And if you run out of words, then just stop. Um, but I don't know anybody who wants to write who once they get started will run out of words. I mean, you do at some point, you just you hit a point where you're, you're done for the day or you're done for the hour, but you still have those words in there. And if you just start putting the words in a row, eventually something will come out. It may not be great. It may not be, um, you may not keep it, but put the words in a row. Sounds very good. Sounds like. Do any of you write longhand, or do you? Is does everyone here start typing? Just curious. I I type my outlines, but then I write the whole thing longhand, and then my first level of editing is typing it in, where it changes where, where they go. So, yeah, I sit down with a huge piece of paper, huge notebook, and just write, 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 and don't let myself leave a room or a place until I have something that something finished. That sounds like my worst nightmare. <laughs> Tim, do you do that too? Or um, I, I think my fear of um, the blank screen is so much uh, more than my fear of the blank page that I start everything in longhand. But I only do the first two or three pages that way. And once I have enough that I can sit down and type that into the computer, then, then the rest of it, I just write at the keyboard. But I can't, I can't sit down and and just write a title onto on a blank page on the screen. That would freak me out. So I need to have at least something to start with. Yeah, usually I'll, and yeah, I'll, I'll go off the idea I had, and so that idea I'll, I will get often when I'm not at a computer. So I, I will write out the idea, and then maybe I'll keep writing and just see what dialogue pops up or what where I think it's going just to give myself a baseline and then then I'll go to the computer and I'll put it in and start kind of shaping it a little more and making it a little more accessible so that's that works and one thing I like to do kind of going back to the last question if you have that if you're not sure where you're going in a story what I tend to do is I'll go back to what I wrote the day before or the last time and rewrite it a few pages and then by the time I get to that blank spot I'm kind of in the groove and I'm ready to kind of try and go off in certain directions. And I haven't, I have ideas that were generated just from doing that rewrite. So I think that that's very helpful for me. That's a very interesting because sometimes the advice you hear to um, writers is never rewrite, just right. forge ahead. And eventually once you have the whole thing, you can knead it into shape or Pare it yeah. down into shape. I can't. I can't do that. <laughs> just, it's impossible. I can't just keep going. I just. I just am so focused on writing a good first draft, and it's you know obviously it's not necessary, but it it just works for me. Is this a your process for short form or also for long form novellas and novels? Is both. This both. Yeah. Okay. So. My next question, uh, again, feeds off of this long form 
short form. Where do you find yourself? Um, do you prefer short story writing to long story, uh, to novels, novellas? Do you use one for one purpose? For example, you write uh, your novels in one genre or subgenre, and you write your short stories in another, or you use your short stories to explore a new character or a new series or a new genre. Could you just talk a little bit about, about that? I'd appreciate it. And Charles, you're on the hot seat because you kind <laughs> of said. Um, I, I've done both. I use the same, I have that same character that I, not in ba backstory, it was kind of a one-off, but um, this character to, that I, I come back to a lot. I've done novels of that. I'm actually working on a novella right now on that on, for him. But um, I use kind of the same approach. I really, I just feel like short story writing helps teach you brevity and focus and, you know, word choice so that you can really make it flow and get some pace to it. I like that. So I really don't do it, anything different for a novel that I, other than just the story is longer, there's more characters, the time frame, because like in a time frame on a short story, I, I always find myself almost trying to keep the time frame within a day, which is for a detective is tough because, you know, there's so much to go to, to detect, right? So I, I tend to go short time span on those. And so a novel, I will obviously spread that out, but, I, I, the, but the approach as a writer, is the same. I don't, I don't change my style of writing or, or even my plotting necessarily. Uh, Greg, I haven't heard from you for a while. Would you like to contribute, uh, speak to this? I know you have an opinion. <laughs> the first thing I ever wrote was a novel, and I, you know, I loved it. It's you have all that room to work and you can take it anywhere you want to. Um, but I find that I enjoy writing short fiction more because of the discipline involved, because you have to be um, focused and short fiction, you know, it's just, it's all bone and muscle and gristle and, um, you have to cut the fat down was with a novel, a novel you can wander around and that's the beauty of a novel. But short fiction makes it more satisfying to me because of the fact that you have to be so focused, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense, I believe. It's um, uh, William, Tim, Donna, Mark, anyone want to talk about that? Uh, my first inclination when I ever get an idea is that it's going to be a short story. And since I'm such a plotter, as I mentioned before, when I start doing those outlines, if by chance those outlines expand where I say, oh, this would be more natural a novella or a novel, then I'll go there. But my, my instinct, I guess I am a short story writer who occasionally does novels, but I think instinctually I am a short story. I, I think, oh, that'd make a great sto short story. And then I guess it has to be a novel, you know, that's sort of it's evolution. <clears throat> okay. I would say I probably gravitate more towards short story just because my writing tends to be more minimalist. So uh, it would be really challenging to come up with 70,000 words for a, a novel or whatever. So um, if I had to get to that point, I feel like it'd be a, a, a number of short stories to get up to that point. So um, I definitely favor the shorter form. Donna? Or Tim. Um, thanks. Uh, I think short stories give me the opportunity to do something that I might not have done before or to, to try something out. Um, so I like them for that point of view, but I don't I don't think I necessarily do anything different. I write short stories, novels and novellas, and I write uh, humorous stuff noir stuff historical crime fiction so I tend to sort of go all over the place um I would probably say that for noir stuff they tend to be shorter I think probably because I don't want to end up depressing myself too much uh, as I'm writing them but I love I love reading long noir stuff but I'm not sure whether I could write a whole noir novel I'd love to try though 
I I would say exactly what Donna just said. Um, I think of myself more as a short story writer. I've only published one novel. I'm finishing a second now. But the the pleasure in writing a novel is the room that you have, um, as Greg said. And but for for me, much like what Donna just said, my, the novels are more um, a little bit more lighthearted because my my short fiction can get really dark, and I don't want to live in that place for the length of time it would take me to write a novel. Um, because once you start working on a story and you get really crazy passionate about it, um, you know it. You live with that for about a month, and I don't. I don't want to be in that place for a lot longer than that. We have a, thank you. Uh, I can definitely understand that. Uh, we have a wonderful question from a viewer. How do you know when a story is done? Do you ever revisit scenarios, the what ifs that you talked about regarding the origins of your stories and write a different story? one that uh, from the, from that same what if scenario, do you use the same what if scenario two times, in other words? Tim, Mark, Molly? I have um, once I used the same the same what if scenario, and it was the one that I was just that I mentioned earlier about you know my dad in the pack of cigarettes. Um, I revisited that in a different format twice and uh, and was happy with it. But generally speaking, I, I don't. In fact, generally speaking, when I've finished a short story, you know it's finished because you have such a wonderful feeling of accomplishment. Yeah, I, I don't usually go. I haven't used the same premise more than once. Um, but as for knowing when it's done, uh, you know, there's that old saw about you know, you just, you stop writing this, you know, it never, it's never finished. You just stop, right. Stop rewriting it. That's kind of a little bit of it, but I think at a certain point, I, I'll reach a point where I feel like, yeah, this is like, I, you know, with a straight face, I can send this off and not be embarrassed by it. So that's kind of my standard. Some of my short stories automatically finish because everybody's dead, but um <laughs> I, I suppose that's probably the only way I know that it's done. But uh, I once did write a short story that I then turned into a novel. So some of the elements remain the same, the characters, um, essentially. And then the, the whole plot changed completely. My, my short stories are never done. I read them in published form and agonize over it. <laughs> I didn't think I should have changed this, I should have changed that. So... I, they'll be done when I'm done, I think. Probably. It's sort of like asking, when is your meal finished, isn't it? I mean, you get full, you stop eating. Yeah, I've never used the same premise twice, but I think for me, that for this particular story that I wrote, I think once I hit that required word count for me, that was when I knew it was done. Okay, we have two other questions, both interesting. Um, what is your favorite short story? And perhaps tell and maybe you can tell us why. And the second question is, do you worry if the protagonist is not liked by critics? If your protagonist is actually unpopular with critics? You can answer either question. I'm sure the answers will be fascinating. I'll jump in with um, one of my favorite short stories, and it was one that really sort of changed, that got me interested in the idea of, of writing seriously when I was a teenager. I read a short story by Pete Hamill called The Men in Black Raincoats, and I bought a copy of Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine as I was on my way to high school. And I went to high school in Manhattan in Chelsea, but I was living in, I, I grew up in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. So I read that story on the subway, and it was a short story that was set in present tense in Brooklyn uh, about a guy that was on the run from the IRA. And it just hadn't occurred to me that you were allowed to write about everything that was around you and happening every day, and that that was legitimate fodder for, for writing, for literature. And 
uh, I was amazed. I, I started looking at my own neighborhood differently. I started looking at it as, you know, stuff that was you could write about. And I reread it recently and it holds up very well. And uh, may I ask how old you were at that point and, and whether you decided to be a writer or not? I would say I was about 15. And I decided I wanted to be a writer and went home and told my parents that. And they said, no, we want you to be a veterinarian. But that didn't really work out for them. There's uh, a short story by Tim O'Brien called How to Tell a True War Story. Mm -hmm. um, which is one of the most remarkable pieces of fiction that I've ever read. Um, and it's about uh, soldiers in Vietnam and how they talk about their experience. And since I come from a military family, that spoke to me immediately, but also just the way he organized the story was captivating. Um, it's it's one of the best things I've ever read. I've always liked, um, and she's not a crime writer that I'm aware of, but Alice Munro writes the most the, the most full short stories I've ever read. I mean, it's it doesn't they're short, but they don't feel short. They feels mm -hmm. like you it's full. It's it's amazing. I you know, and I that's what has always uh, she's always been an amazing writer, humbling when you read it as a writer too. But, um, and as, as for the first question about uh, have, wanting my protagonist to be liked, I definitely do. I, I would feel terrible if my protagonist, if I didn't make my protagonist empathetic enough or have the reader have enough empathy for that person to, to be critical, I, I just, that would bother me a little bit. I, I guess an unreliable narrator, it would be a little, I don't know. I, I wouldn't feel great about it. Uh, my favorite short story wouldn't be a uh, crime short story, but I'd uh, say David Berman's clip on tie would be my favorite. It's more of a series of uh, funny observations and works itself into a story. But um, I would also agree that I'd want my pro protagonist to be likable. My, my favorite short story, I'm sort of a, something of a classicist, would probably be The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. I think that's just a perfect building to a, a, a climatic reveal. Among modern writers, the one that comes immediately to mind is Paul Finch has, a, has, a, has one called The Skeleton Crew, which is about a, a police force that has a shortage of uh, people on duty and uh, uh, a killer that wants to take revenge. And, it's really, really good. Um, as far as my my protagonist, I think I would like everyone, to, even if it's an anti-hero. You know, I mean, you can make you can make Michael Corleone or the devil in Paradise Lost the the, the protagonist, but you still have to make him somehow somehow uh, accessible to a reader. So if, if I felt my audience didn't uh, understand my protagonist, even if he or she were out and out evil. I think my story would fail and, you know, then you require some rewriting. Okay, thank For me, you. My, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Donna. Um, my favorite short stories are Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper okay. um, and Shirley jo Jackson's The Lottery, I suppose, are um, my favorites. And as for, I prefer my protagonists to be liked, but as long as the reader cares about what happens to them, even if what they want to happen to them is that they die a horrible death. Then that's the important thing for me, I think. Thank you. Um, okay, we have another question considering not creative process in a sense, but I guess the polishing process. Um, our viewers want to know, do you let your friends or family read your stories before you submit them? Where do you find trusted readers? What do you look for in trusted readers? When do you bring your trusted readers in? Do you discuss your stories with your family or friends before, during, or after writing them? You know, basically, when do you let people in? This is the question. Donna, thank you, since you're the last who's spoken. Um, probably right from the start. Um, 
since for this story i actually stole one of my partner's ideas a, a comment that he'd made and I, and i nicked it so i probably uh discuss with him right from the start but he's not a crime fiction fan so uh, if he tells me it's okay then that's fine as far as i'm concerned but i also have a, a couple of friends that i will say oh i've written this story would you would you have a look at this um yeah, so right from the start, and I'll talk about it all the time uh, right from the start. But I also don't want to burden people with reading this rubbish that I've written. So, uh, yeah, so it's a it's a sort of a trade-off between those two things. I don't believe anyone would feel burdened reading anything that you've written, but <laughs> thank you for your modesty. Uh, Mark, do you bring in friends or, or trusted readers or you just keep it to yourself and hit submit send and yeah I, do, I just keep it to myself i think i'd be embarrassed giving it to to people before i thought it was finished so um i i tend not to share anything i'll share i i will share the story idea um but i won't uh, not a lot of it though uh, my wife will read it my daughter who is a writer now will read it and then i have a friend julie who will read it uh, who's a writer and but I don't I don't want to give anything away so that they can experience experience it in a fresh way so that they're not kind of poisoned by what I've told them in the past so I but I'll wait till I feel like it's pretty in pretty good shape or when I feel like maybe I'm kind of stuck here I know or does this scene work or not work and but those are the three I I trust the most with the uh, early parts of my story Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you, Charles, Mark, William, Greg. I can't see you all, <laughs> and that helps. Donna, uh, Tim, for sharing your your writer's journey. Um, I'm we're going to sign off now, but I did want to remind everyone to join us this Tuesday, April fourth, at seven p.m. Eastern Daylight Time for a conversation with the nominees for the G.P. Putnam Sons Sue Grafton Memorial Award. And um, you can learn more about the Edgar Awards in general by following us on social media using the Edgar's 2023, that's all together, Edgar's 2023 hashtag, or by visiting the websites mysterywriters.org and or Edgar Awards. I had one last question I so wish I could get in, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and then we'll sign off. It's a question about the business of writing. Where is there a market for short stories these days? I mean. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll, I'll jump in really quick and tell you that was the reason that, that Brooklyn Noir occurred and then the Noir series at Akashic was because I had written a story that I felt I didn't have a market for. It was too graphic for um for alfred hitchcock or Ellery queen and i did not have a market for it and so uh i pitched the idea of the anthology to johnny temple at akashic so that we would have a place for the for that kind of short fiction well thank you tim uh akashic's a wonderful wonderful uh, publisher i was actually one of my publishers but uh yeah, the, the marketplace for short stories is not as... It's tough. It's tough. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you again very, very much. And thank you viewers for joining us today, you know, and joining this conversation. Your questions were right on point. I think we all had a good and vibrant discussion. And I want to wish you the best. And uh, I hope that, you know, you'll tune in to the Edgar Awards. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And congratulations to the, all the other nominees. You yes, too. Likewise. You too. Thank you, Persia. And I loved all your stories. So thank you very much for writing them. Thank you. And thank Katie for her technical introduction. <laughs> <laughs>